Good morning, Crossview. We're so glad you're here to worship with us. Today we get to sing some great songs and hear a wonderful message about God's love for us. And I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of who I am in God's eyes often. That if you imagine people who have had babies, that innocent newborn child that fits in one or two hands, that's how God sees you, that you're precious, that you are cherished and loved in a way that we can't understand fully, but we can emulate that, right? So could you stand and worship with us so that we can sing about God's love?
hosts of heaven. Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only Christ.
and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who could to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now the gospel truth of together. Heavenly Father, you are so gracious, Lord. Regardless of the condition of our hearts, you hold us as precious, unique, beloved creations you have made. Help us remember your majesty, your sovereignty over all things, your presence with us at all times, and your loving sacrifice of your Son. Teach us to love others as you love. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. My name is Kale. I am the pastor of Student Ministries, uh, particularly Apex Ministries, which is our middle school and high school ministry. Uh, and But today, I actually just have the pleasure uh, to be here and give you guys a few announcements and to release the kids. I won't forget this time. Uh, Sunday school, children, you are able to go to your classrooms right now. So go learn about Jesus. Have fun. We'll see you in a little bit. If you are new here at Crossview, uh, first off, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have you here. Um, we would actually like to meet you in person as well, so make sure you stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. Let them know that this is your first time here. We actually have a physical gift to give you, uh, and we would love to get to know you uh, and, and meet you personally. If you consider Crossview Church to be your home uh, and you want to give as an act of, the Lord, uh, act of worship to the Lord, you can do so in the app, our church center app, or you can give in the black boxes at the back of the worship center. Now, like I said, I'm here to give you guys a couple of quick announcements, and so there's a few of them here today, uh, but first, we're going to start out with Crossview 101. Now, this is a class that was designed uh, to teach all who are interested in learning more about what we believe here at Crossview Church, what we believe and why we believe it, and it's a, it's a three-week uh, series. It's just on three Tuesdays uh, and consecutive Tuesday, Tuesdays from 6.30 to 7.45, and we're starting another uh, round of these classes this Tuesday, the 20th. And so if you uh, want to know more about Crossview or you're interested in becoming a member, this is a requirement to being a member at Crossview is to come to, come to the Crossview 101 courses. Uh, join us this Tuesday at 6.30 uh, to go through those classes. But if you are not interested, if you're not there yet, you're not quite interested in becoming a member yet, or maybe you've already taken these classes, uh, we have something else for you as well. So this Tuesday, we are going to be having another class. Uh, this is our fasting seminar. We did this last month, uh, and it was such a good turnout and such uh, well-received, and enough people have wanted to do it again, uh, that we're bringing it back a second month in a row. And so if you're interested in more about biblical fasting, uh, we would encourage you to come as well. Join us again uh, this Tuesday at 6.30 uh, for that class. Yes. <laughs> 
Now, last week, you may have noticed in your email inboxes that we sent out a spiritual survey. Uh, this is not spam. Uh, we're not trying to sell you anything. We're just, we're trying to get an idea of the spiritual climate of our church. And so, uh, if you can, I, I would encourage you to fill out that survey this week. Uh, let us know uh, where you are in your beliefs. Um, don't answer the way you think it should be answered. Answer the way that's honest to you. Answer what you truly believe. Uh, we would like to know. It's a confidential, uh, and, and we don't know who's even filling out these. There, And so uh, just fill it out the way you believe those things, and um, you have this week to do that. This is the last time we're going to talk about it. And so uh, please take a look at those. You can find it if you've already deleted it or showed up in your junk mail. Uh, you can find it in the Church Center app uh, and fill it out there. Now, men, uh, those of you who went to the No Regrets uh, conference last month, um, we are having a follow-up Bible study series on that. That's going to be a six-week series starting on Tuesday mornings uh, at 7 a.m. at Perkins, and it's going to be going every other week. Now, this is not just for those who went to that conference. Really, it's for all men, um, but it is going to be a follow-up to that conference. Uh, we would encourage you to join us. So if you're interested in getting some bacon and eggs, join us at Perkins uh, for this follow-up uh, Bible study course. Um, yeah, uh, you do have to register for this one, so please register by March 2nd to let us know you're coming. All right, my last announcement for you guys is uh, our missions moment. So every month we go over and remind you of one of the missionaries that we support uh, around the world. And this week we are talking about the Allards. Now the Allards hold a special place in my heart because 10 years ago they sang at uh, our wedding, so that was pretty cool. But now they are missionaries out in England and they're serving God out there. And so uh, they have given us a few things that we can be praying for. They're listed up on the screen. Uh, so please join in us praying this week over the Allards. Uh, in, in your prayer requests or in your, in your prayer time, uh, be praying over the Allards. Now, Doug is helping churches in the area with their music ministry. He coaches churches in the area. He also leads worship every Sunday morning, uh, and he works just with different uh, music ministries in the area. Rachel, uh, his wife, uh, helps churches in the area with children's ministry uh, as well as participating in the music ministry as well. Um, like I said, you can find those prayer requests in your email announcements. You can find it as well. Um, but for right now, uh, I will pray for them, uh, and then we'll also pray for, over our service. So if you guys want to bow your heads with me, uh, let's continue in prayer. God, we, we thank you, um, first and foremost, for your love and your goodness. God, you are a God who chooses to love us, despite the fact that uh, we don't deserve it. But you've chosen it. And you've said it, and so we believe it. God, I pray over the Allards that you would move mightily and boldly in their ministry. That you would bring salvation to those who hear the gospel. And you would pray, uh, that we would pray for wisdom as well for them. That they would interact with people in their churches, some of which who are hostile uh, or from hostile countries towards the gospel. We pray that you would use them, use the Allards to build up these houses of worship in England. And we pray that you would use them to encourage others in their worship. We pray that you would provide for the Allards and their daily needs. Now, God, I, I turn this prayer towards us. I pray that you would uh, use this time, that you would, you would encourage and you would move us as well, that you would draw near to us and, and remind us just of who you are as a God who listens, a God who responds, and a God who really loves us and renews us. And because of that, God, I, I pray that we would too listen. Listen to what you have to say to us and respond with love in return. God, we also pray for renewal in us today. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and continue to worship with us?
for the reading of God's Word. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 13. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is gracious, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Earl. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, Cross you. It's good to be with you. Would you bow your heads with me as I pray? Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for blessing us with your presence. We need more of you in our lives, and that's why we're here, to worship you, to glorify your name, and to have a little bit of who you are rub off onto us. So please do that as we enter this time in your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as many of you know, we are in a series on prayer where we're looking at prayer and what it is and why we do it and all these different things. And uh, I've been reading lots of books on prayer through this series. And one of the books that I read, it was a book by a guy named Kevin DeYoung. And uh, he wrote in a book about prayer and he said this thing. He said, few things in the Christian life are more essential than prayer and few things in the Christian life make us struggle more than prayer. So there's this essentialness to prayer in the Christian life, yet there's also this struggle to pray as God's people. And I think many of us can relate to the fact that there's sometimes where I just don't feel like praying. And we're in this series on prayer, and it would be a, a, a loss, it'd be a tragedy if we never talked about, what about those times when we just don't feel like praying? Why is prayer a struggle for so many of us? Well, there's the obvious reasons. There's this sinful nature still inside of us. We're not fully holy yet until we see Christ, and so there's always this battle 
of sin in our heart that's going to war against us praying. We live in a place where Satan is allowed to roam and rule for a period of time before Christ returns. And so there's no doubt satanic attack on our lives where Satan wants to hold us back from praying. It is known, prayer is known as a spiritual discipline. So there is some discipline to making this happen, which could feed into it as well. So there's lots of different ideas and reasons for this struggle. But oftentimes when we talk about prayer, we talk about the motivation for it simply in the terms of the will. You should pray more. I should pray more. And though that's true, it's not a lie, there's truth to it, it can lack motivation. If we only focus on the we must pray, we're missing a huge important part. The missing piece is knowing who God is. Knowing the God we pray to. Knowing the God who invites us to come into his presence and be with us. That's the belief part. Prayerlessness, when I have no prayer in my life, means one of two things. Either one, it means I don't believe God is powerful enough to do anything and prayer doesn't do anything. Or two, I don't believe he's good enough to take the power he has to benefit me in my life. There's a longing in every human soul to be with something bigger than themselves. There's a longing in every human soul, this transcendence, this wanting to be and wanting to know something bigger than themselves. The author of Ecclesiastes wrote about it and said that God has placed eternity in the hearts of every human. There's this longing for something that's bigger than the here and now, this longing for something that we want Because prayer is a fight for belief, we have to understand and know the God we're praying to. If our only motivation is you should pray, though it's true, it's not really effective because we know we should pray. In fact, people very, very far from God know they should pray. The breakthrough comes when we understand who is the God we're praying to. The breakthrough comes when we see that this God we're praying to is our Heavenly Father who loves us so much and now our soul shifts from I have to pray to I want to be in the presence of this God. Where the longing of transcendence in my heart, the eternity longing in my heart is fulfilled by being with him. When Jesus talks about prayer, it's interesting that the number one thing he says that we should do in prayer, the number one thing that you see when Jesus talks about prayer, he says, ask, ask, seek, knock, ask. Jesus says, you should ask. If you knew who this was, you would get it. You should ask. Jesus wants us to hear loud and clear that your heavenly father is good and he's eager to be with you and he wants you to ask him for things. He's eager to be a good dad to us. Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, Teach us how to pray. And it's interesting that when they came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray, Jesus, when he instructed them back to tell them how to pray, he didn't say, well, here's what you do. Kneel down like this, face Jerusalem, make sure you do it for this amount of minutes, make sure you do it during this time of day. No, 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 no. He didn't say all that. When they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, the very first thing that came out of his mouth was, when you pray, you say, our Father. That would have blew their mind as disciples grown up in a Jewish context that now the God of the universe in human form, Jesus is saying, let me tell you something about this God. This God is your father. No wonder why 
when they asked him how to pray, the first thing he said you have to get into your head is that God is your father. Remember who you're praying to. Remember you're coming into the presence of one who loves you, who's your heavenly father. See, that is the motivation for prayer. That is the motivation that we need, this earth-shattering awareness and truth that God in heaven is our loving Father who's eager, loving, and kind and longs to meet with us. So how do we get that? How do we realize that? How do we change from I have to pray to I want to pray? Well, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked. And I'm not sure I can fully answer it, but I'm going to give it a shot. If you have a Bible, I encourage you you to open to Psalm 103. If you haven't already, uh, Psalms in the middle of the Bible. If you have an electronic Bible, you can turn it on and click on Psalm 103. Just a side note, if you are a regular or you're starting to come to Crossview Church a lot, we encourage you to bring a Bible to Sunday mornings, either a a Bible like this or on your phone electronically, or you can use the Bible in a seat in front of you. Uh, We regularly go through the Bible during these times, and it's good for you to see it as we go through this. So it's something we encourage you to do. Today, we're going to look at our souls, and we're going to look at God. We're going to look at our souls, and we're going to look at God. And Psalm 103 addresses both. And today's going to be kind of more like a Bible study than a sermon as we wander through this. So let's look at Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. David is a psalmist, and he's saying this. He says, praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice who David, the guy who wrote this, is talking to. Who is he talking to? Praise the Lord, my soul. He's talking to his soul. He's having a conversation with his soul. The rest of this psalm is an interaction between David and his soul. He's dialoguing with his soul. He's saying, soul, don't forget his benefits. Soul, praise his holy name. So that begs the question, what is our soul? What is our soul? Our soul is the central core of a person. The central core of who we are. It's like the mission control of our life. It's our mind, our will, our emotion, It's where we think, where we decide, where we feel. All that comes out of our soul. And as followers of Jesus, it's extremely important that we take care of and take inventory of our souls. The soul is the most neglected part of a person, I think. But it's the spot where we notice God in our life. It's important to care for our souls. When a pastor in the past was charged and installed into the duty of pastor, it was very, very clear that what the pastor was doing is they were taking this calling to care for souls. They would speak that often. We don't say it as much today as we used to. A care for souls, that's something I take seriously. No one wants to damage their soul. But by default, our souls get damaged, and we need to care for them. And the practice we need to develop is what David is doing here, where he's talking to his soul, and he's doing something that I want to show you that is godly, and it's something that the people of the past who followed God did through the ages. First of all, no, David is not having some sort of self-help talk with his soul. He's not trying to give himself like a pep talk. He was engaged in a spiritual practice. This is something the ancient church did when they wanted to change the want-tos in their heart. When they noticed things like, I know I should pray, but I don't. They didn't just say, well, I guess I won't pray. No, they entered into this practice of changing and redirecting their soul's desire back to God. And that's exactly what David's doing here. We need to redirect our soul's affections to God, or what I'm going to call this morning, bending our soul 
toward God. That's what we see David doing here. He's bending his mind, his will, his emotions, his passions, his desires, his longings, all towards God. He's directing them to God. Praise the Lord, my soul. He's speaking his soul in this direction. This psalm is one of my favorites because it teaches us that growing close to God involves us consistently bending, it's uncomfortable at times, but bending our affections toward God. This is a regular spiritual practice that we see. It's in the Bible and it's been throughout church history. There's one revivalist preacher in the 1900s who would say, when I start and I have my prayer time, I always start off in the hard fleshly body, but I end up in the spirit of God. I think that picture's prayer. We start off, it feels like this thing. We, we almost force ourselves. We say, praise the Lord, my soul. We have to talk and get it in. But then we end up in the presence of Almighty God because he comes to us in those places. Verse 1, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Some translations have bless. Bless the Lord, my soul. Bless his holy name. This says praise. Why are there two different words? In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, there are two different words for the word praise. One is halal. It's where we get hallelujah. It means praise God. The other is barak. It means bless. That's what we have here. In Psalm 103, it's barak. Bless the Lord. That's why some translations put bless. Why does the NIV that I'm using have praise? Because it's trying to capture something that's another part of this word. You see, this word barak, which means bless, isn't just bless. There's another part to this Hebrew word. It's the notion that's more physical. It means not just to bless, but to bend or to bow. And that's what David's doing here. That's what he's capturing here. It's not just bless. It's to bend or bow. And the NIV is trying to capture that by saying David is talking to his soul and saying, bend, praise, bow to the Lord, my soul. We see this word in other places in the Old Testament. In Genesis 24, I bow down and worship the Lord. They took that one. They they used two words to describe that word. I bow down and I worshiped. We see it again in Nehemiah chapter 8. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their face to the ground. See, a bow in that Hebrew culture wasn't like this. A bow was prostrate down on the ground. A few weeks ago, we looked at 2 Chronicles 20 and our friend King Jehoshaphat, he said he, same word, bowed down with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. See, not, God not only blesses us with his goodness, his mercy, his kindness, his grace, but we respond by blessing God. Well, how do we bless God? How do we bless God who has no need of anything? What do human beings do? What, I mean, how are we supposed to bless God? We bless God in our bowing, in our bending, in our submitting to him in his wills and his ways. So here in Psalm 103, what David is doing is he's depicting the Christian life as one where we habitually bend our soul's affections towards God. This is the right response for followers of Jesus Christ. We bow our hearts. We bend our souls. We reorient our hearts towards God. This is what we're talking about here. We take our mind, our will, our emotions, our desires, and we intentionally bend those towards God. We give those to him. We project our heart affections upon him. Praise the Lord, O my soul. This is what David is saying. Soul, take all the affections. Take your pain, take your hurt, take your ideas, take your thoughts, take your desires, and place them upon God. The soul in the Old Testament was the life breath of a person. 
There's a tie when God created human beings and he breathed life into them where this idea of soul is emerged there. Soul is not just the essence of life, our mind, will, and emotion, but it's also what makes life worth living. Our passions, our desires, our wants, our loves. When we are exhorted to bend our heart's affections towards God, we are asked to bend all that makes life worth living and give it to him and submit it to who he is. We bend our souls towards the God of heaven. And when we do that, we will never, ever, 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 ever regret it. We'll never, ever, ever regret it. We'll never say, I wish I would have poured my soul out somewhere else in some other thing. Because God is the only one who can satisfy. But here's the deal. When we live in the here and now, everything rushes into our soul to pull our attention away from bending. C.S. Lewis said it like this. It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. See if this is true of you. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply of shoving them all back. This is what it looks like to bend your soul. In listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in, and so on all day. Standing back from all of your natural fussings and frettings coming in out of the wind. That's what it looks like to bend your soul towards God. Do you feel that when you wake up? All of life just starts immediately rushing in. It's a vital practice for us as Christians to push that back and say, praise the Lord, my soul, and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. You see, sometimes we view ourselves as victims of our emotions. Our emotions come in and we have no choice but to bow to them, to bend to them. And emotions are good things. Emotions are strong things. But emotions are very fickle things as well. They peak and then they disappear. And God gave us a soul where emotions are a part, but they're not the only part. There's the mind and the will. And we don't just say, well, I don't feel like praying, so I'm just not going to pray. That's how oftentimes we live as Americans. I don't feel like doing that, so I'm not going to do it. God must not want me to do it. No, God's calling us to something greater. He's calling us to take that emotion and don't give into it. Don't just say that's how it is. No, bend. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. The answer is to bend your soul towards God. David reminds us here that bending our soul's affections towards God requires decision, intentionality, resisting the flow, and yes, I will even say pain at times. Because following our hearts can be a good thing, but following our hearts could also be a disastrous thing. I've seen people shipwreck their lives because they were following their heart. A couple weeks ago, I was watching in, in one of the heartbreaking mass shootings that it seems like we hear of over and over and over. They were talking to the shooter, and the shooter said he did all this because he was following his heart. A heart bending towards God? Good thing. A heart satisfying itself and other things? Not such a good thing. The prophet Jeremiah said it like this, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Following our heart is not the ultimate guide unless we are bending our soul towards God. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. As we bend our souls toward God, we're bending to the only person in the world who can satisfy us fully. See, that's the lie, that if you bend your soul towards God, you'll miss out on all these great things. No, I'm suggesting this morning the opposite is true. If you take your soul and bend it to everything this world has to offer, you are going to be eventually in a spot where you're thirsty, desperate, hungry, tired, and hurt. But if you bend your soul towards the living God, 
who Jesus reminds us is our Father, that's where true life begins. That's where true life flows. So, who is this Father that Jesus told us about? Look at verse 3. David tells his soul to bend towards God. Don't forget his benefits. This is who he is. And then he goes and tells us, he, well, actually he tells his soul who this is. Here's who this father is, soul. This soul, wake up, pay attention, praise the Lord, soul. This father is one who forgives all your sins, soul, who heals all your diseases, soul. So diseases there isn't talking physical diseases. It's talking the diseases of the soul, He's talking to his soul. He forgives your sins, soul. He heals your diseases, soul. He redeems your life from the pit, soul. He crowns you with love and compassion, soul. He satisfies your desire with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is who God is. This is the Father that Jesus wanted us to pray to. This is what happens when we go there. This is why we need to be motivated by this, not simply by saying we should pray. It's bigger than that. And when we do that, we are satisfied. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are healed. We are renewed. How can you miss out by bending your soul towards God? Your soul is forgiven, redeemed, healed, renewed, satisfied in the midst of a holy God. Richard Stearns who used to be the president of World Vision, tells a story that illustrates this, that how bending our soul and finding who God is is not dependent upon the outward circumstances of our life. He reflects on a visit to a church in Haiti a year after the earthquake that devastated that place in 2010. He said the church's building consisted of a tent made of white tarps and duct tape. It was pitched in the midst of the sprawling camp of thousands of people who were still homeless one year after the earthquake. And this is how he describes the church in that place and the lesson that God taught him. He said, in the front row sat six amputees, ranging from ages 6 to 60. They were clapping and smiling as they sang song after song and lifted their prayer to God. The worship was full of hope and thanksgiving to the Lord. No one was singing louder or praying more fervently than Demosi. She was a 32-year-old, unemployed, single mother of two. During the quake, a collapsed building crushed her right arm and her left leg. After four days, both limbs had to be amputated. She was now today leading the choir, leading prayers, standing on her prosthesis and lifting her one hand high in praise to God. Following the service, I met Demosi's two daughters, ages 8 and 10. The three of them now live in a tent 5 feet by 8 feet wide. Despite losing her job, her home, two limbs, she is deeply grateful because God spared her life January 12th of that year. She told me he brought me back like Lazarus, giving me the gift of life. She said, I believe I survived this devastating quake for two reasons. One, to raise my girls in the ways of God. And two, to serve the Lord any way he'd want me to for at least a few more years. Richard Stern said, it made no sense to me as an entitled American who is put off by the smallest inconveniences, a slow Wi-Fi connection, a clogged drain, Yet here in this place, many people who lost everything express nothing but praise. I find my own sense of charity for people like Demosi inadequate. They have so much more to offer me than I do to offer them. I feel pity and sadness for them, but it's they who should feel pity for me, for the shallowness of my walk with Jesus Christ. You see, when we bend our souls towards God, there's a depth that occurs in our relationship with him. There's a maturity that happens. There's a strengthening that happens that takes our heart's affections off the things of the world that we look to for comfort and puts it on who he is. But 
But then to drive the point home, David does something else. He quotes in this psalm what we could call the Old Testament vision statement of who God our Father is. If you go into organizations and see different things, you see vision statements in different places. There's a vision statement in the Bible of who God is. It's in the Old Testament all over the place. There's this amazing phrase that God wants us to think of when we think of who is it that we're praying to. Because he repeats this statement over and over and over again. It's a phrase we see throughout the Old Testament. It is who God is. He's saying, when you bend your soul's affections, I want you to know who it is you're bending to. This is who I am. I want you to grab a hold of it, and it's in verse 7 and 8 of Psalm 103. He says, He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds of the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. This is God's mission statement of who he is. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and bounding in love. And we see this in many different places throughout the Old Testament. It's like the, God is shouting at us, this is what I'm like. This is who I am. He just, this describes God our Father. Sometimes I've heard in the church world that there's the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Usually with that, there's this thing that the God of the Old Testament is this mean, wrathful God, and the God of the New Testament is this God of love. If you ever hear that, just reject it out of your mind. Don't let it even sink in, because it's not true. God is God. He doesn't change. And the God of the Old Testament is good, gracious, loving, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. And the God of the New Testament is the same. And we're going to see that this mission statement of who God is is interwoven like a thread throughout the whole Old Testament. I'm going to show you at least six places. Now I'm going to do something that preaching professors at seminary say you should never, ever do. All of a sudden you pay attention. I got all your attention with that. What does that say? They say that you should never take a sermon and jump around to a bunch of different places in the Bible because you'll lose people. Some seminary professors say that. Other seminary professors say, no, you should do that because it teaches people how to use the Bible and go and see different spots. Both are probably right and both are probably wrong. Here we are, we're going to do it. <laughs> so by turning the Bible to different places, I'm going to show you this thread of who God is, this vision statement of who God our Father is, who Jesus was talking about when he said, remember God is your Father. This is what he wanted in our mind. Now, I'm going to jump to a few different spots. If you have a Bible that's on a phone, it'll probably be easy to go through. If not, you can follow along. If you're getting frustrated, just sit back and enjoy the ride. Don't get mad, all right? But let's look at these things. The first one I want to look at is Exodus 34. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. The second book is Exodus. Go to chapter 34. Here's what's happening in Exodus 34. Moses came to the Lord, and he was disappointed and overwhelmed. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been disappointed in life? Have you been overwhelmed in life? Moses was there, and he went to God. Exodus 34, verse 6. And God came in Moses' disappointment. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming this. As Moses is bending his heart towards God, here's what God's saying back to him. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Does that sound familiar at all? There's the vision statement of who God is. God wants us to say, this is who I am. So what do we learn from this interaction with Moses? We learn that we bend our overwhelmed soul toward God our Father. It continues. Go to the Psalms. Back to Psalm 103 where we are. Turn to the left and go to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. The same guy who wrote Psalm 103, David, wrote this in Psalm 86. 
And in Psalm 86, verse 1, he's pouring out his heart to God. He says, hear me, Lord, answer me, for I am poor and needy. He's feeling needy. He doesn't have what he wants. And so he doesn't just say, well, this is how it is. No, he bends his soul towards God. He makes this decision to seek God in the midst of his poor and neediness. And he finds God, because this is what he says in verse 15, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. There it is again. This is who God is. When we pray, when we bend our soul, this is who we're bending to. This tells us to bend our poor and needy soul towards God the Father. Guess what? This Old Testament vision statement of who God is shows up another place. Again in the Psalms, turn past 103 and go to Psalm 145. This isn't a heartbreaking psalm. In Psalm 145, David's excited. He's happy. He's full of joy. He's praising and exalting God. In Psalm 145, 1 and 2, he says, I will exalt you, my God, my King. I will praise your name forever. Every day I will praise you. He's in a great spot. There's amazing things happening. And in this moment of gratitude, he again bends his soul towards God the Father. And this is who he finds in verse 8. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. That's who God the Father is. So this tells us that we can bend our excited and grateful soul toward God our Father. Guess what? This Old Testament vision statement shows up again in another place. In Numbers 15, go way back. Numbers chapter 15. I'm sorry, Numbers 14. Exodus, Leviticus, then Numbers. You get to 14. The people of God feel like they failed God. Have you ever felt like you failed God? Have you ever felt like it's not something you know God wants you to do and you didn't do it and you regret it? Here the people of God lack courage to do what God called them to do. God said, enter the promised land, go, and they didn't. They didn't trust God. And instead they started kind of bad-mouthing God. In verse 2, it says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, their leaders, and the whole assembly said, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. It would have been better if we died. They're crying that out. And God said to them, You needed to enter the land. That's what I called you to do. And they didn't do it because they were afraid and they didn't trust him. And then they felt the weight of not trusting God. They felt the weight of the sin of that. They regretted that. And then they bend their soul towards God, and guess what they found? Guess who they found God to be? Look at verse 18 in Numbers 14. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. When you are at that place where you regret what you did, you failed God, you can know that when you turn to God, the God that Jesus said is your Father, what you're going to find is that God is there slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving the sin and rebellion that you tore away when you knew you shouldn't have done it. So this is saying, you know what we can do? We can bend our regretful soul toward God our Father. Guess what? It shows up again. Perhaps you feel ashamed or guilty of your sin. Have you ever felt shame and guilt for your sin? Turn to Joel chapter 2. Go far to the right. If you hit the New Testament, you went too far. You see Matthew, Mark, stop, come back. Right after the book of Hosea, there's Joel. Joel's a prophet, and he's telling people about what it's going to be like when God returns. And he says, when Jesus comes back, when God returns, it's going to be great for those who are near to God. It's going to be terrifying for those who are far from God. And he says this in Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. He's calling out to those who are far from God. He says, return back to me. Bend the affections of your heart towards God. And guess what you will find in verse 13? 
Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Why? For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love and relents from calamity. There's the vision statement of who God is again. So this tells us we can bend our repentant soul towards God the Father. If you're in Joel, turn to Obadiah the ne- or uh, Amos, the next book. It's like right next to, right behind Joel, and then you'll come to Obadiah, which is one chapter, and then you'll get to Jonah, where we're going to see it again. In this one, in Jonah, we see when human beings are their absolute worst, it doesn't change who God is. When human beings are their absolute worst, ugly place, it doesn't change who God is in his vision statement. Jonah was reluctant and resistant to God's will. God called Jonah and said, I want you to go to these people in Nineveh, and I want you to tell them who I am. And he said, no. You know why? Because he just said, I don't like those people, and I know who you are. You will forgive them, and you'll bring them into the kingdom because you're nice and kind and compassionate and slow to anger and forgiving, and you'll bring them in, and I don't like them. I want them out of my church. I don't want them in my church, so I'm going to run to another country and not tell them. He was resistant, but he wasn't just resistant, he was racist. Ugliness came up into his heart. Have you ever found it difficult to have compassion on people who disagree with you? Have you ever found it difficult to have compassion on people who are different than you are? It doesn't change who this God is. And he calls us to bend our soul to him because check this out. Jonah chapter 4 verse 1. But to Jonah this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall going to those people and I fled to Tarshish. Because, here it is, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. And I knew that you would express that to those people because that's who you are. So what does that tell us? We can bend our resistant heart to God the Father. We can take the ugliest stuff inside of us and bend to him. And say, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Come to this God. This statement of who God is, this picture that Jesus wanted us to have when we say our Father, it occurs again and again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. This is who he is. This is your loving Father Forgiving, merciful, loving, redeeming, satisfying, renewing, compassionate, gracious, abounding in love. When Jesus said, our Father, this is who he was talking about. This is whose presence we enter when we pray. When we say, our Father, this is who we're coming to. So how do I bend the affections of my soul towards God, practically. If you may remember a sermon I gave before when we talked about being saved and how you're justified, that God comes in and declares you righteous, then you start this process of becoming more and more holy called sanctification. In this process, it's really good for us to get used to bending our soul towards God. So how do we do it? Really, really practical, the first place you start is you thank and praise God. Gratitude leans our soul towards God the Father. As a practice, I encourage you, before you put your head on the pillow, you look back at your day and you find one thing that you're grateful to God for, one thing that expresses his love for, of who he is to you, and you say, God, thank you for that. Gratitude bends our soul towards God. Thankfulness to him pulls us towards him. There's a power in gratitude. That's why thanks and praise is often interwoven. 
And then you just say this simple prayer. God, I bend my soul toward you. You start in the flesh, thank and praise God, and you end up in the spirit as you ask him to come. And you lean into his ways. Jamie Dunlap wrote this in an article on the father's love. He said, God designed the father-child relationship to teach us about him. It wasn't just a convenient illustration. He designed it with his relationship with you in mind. Not all of us grew up with great fathers or even knowing our father, but we all have a sense of what a good father should be. We all have a sense that a father's love is not rooted in the child's performance or the child's lovability, but the father's love is rooted in the heart of the father. God loves you, Christian. Full stop, no qualifications, no ifs, ands, or buts. He delights in you. He wanted to be your father before the foundation of the world was here. That was his desire. His affection for you is not based on your performance or your ability to be loved. He loves you because that is who he is and he is good. Do my kids make me happy or sad by what they do? Of course. Can we grieve God's spirit? Of course. But is my love as a father conditioned and dependent upon my kids' performance? Never. How could it be any different with our perfect heavenly father? May we know the love of our father. And may our hearts and our souls bend and bow towards him. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Let's pray. God, you are so good. Even what we talk about here doesn't do it justice. You are so compassionate. You are so gracious. You are so abounding in love. You are so kind. You satisfy our hearts with good things. You renew our strength. You do not always accuse us harbor your anger. You do not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities because your love is so high. And as far as the east is from the west, you've removed our sin for us because you are a father of compassion and mercy and grace and abounding love. God, I ask if there's areas of our heart that have developed wrong thinking about who you are through past pains or hurts or ideas or bad teaching, will you come and rework those? Undo those with your gracious hand. Redeem those by your loving kindness that we may see you as you truly are. And as you open the eyes of our heart to see and behold you, God, Help us to bend towards you. Help us to not be victims of our emotions or our feelings or our desires, but to submit those and bring those to you, the one true soul satisfier. We worship you this morning, for you are good. And we praise you. And we say all that is in our inmost being, praise the Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we worship. I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend And he is my strength He is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire With me in the storm Let all my 
Allow the truth of that to sink deep in your soul well beyond after you leave here today. And take with you this blessing. That God, our Father, our Father who is compassionate, our Father who is gracious, our Father who is abounding in love, may you know him And may you be with him 
And in that place, may the Holy Spirit reorient your soul's affections upon him. May the Holy Spirit redirect misconceived ideas about who God is in your soul back to the truth of who God the Father is. And may you be blessed. May the love of this Father, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may this fellowship and accompanying of the Holy Spirit be with you this week. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a beautiful week.